money miners. The only thing as good as the Atabasca Basin is access modern technology or figured out. The trusted advisor in drill hole survey instrumentation, and they're going to be absolutely getting shit as accurate as possible in Canada forever. They're I over think. there. Yeah, they, they're over there. Yep. They're not just Australia. They are global experts. Mm-hmm. Get them Everywhere. involved in your business. Boys. Oh. Conveniently, there's a bit more uranium news. Happy to help. Uh, it's what I'll do. Looks like a deal could be falling over, Matty. <laughs> Maybe. There's a bit of – there's a – I'm going into some unwanted history, but the history does mean something and it's going to be a punchline at the end. It's like Pulp Fiction all coming together. I like it. <sighs> Mate, you, I'm excited to see what you've come up with. You boys have uh, – you're probably the only boys in Australia that can make financial results so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's ever been done before. The big uh, Australian, they came out with their, their annual annual results, um, which JD's gone yeah. into. Thankfully, mm. I, I before you fall that. asleep, it is actually interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no need for coffee with the boys uh, getting into the weeds. Trav, you got bloody, what are you? You got a bit going on, a bit of yeah. 29 medals. I did. I, did, I just tried to, to pick a couple of interesting stories out there. Like one, one being Galan's got this, you know, off take, maybe. Um, which isn't with Glencore, by the way, and uh, then 29 medals. Like uh, th- th- Their statements come out and I just always – it's kind of like quarterlies, mate. I read them back to front. Um, and so I just I just highlighted a couple of things in the notes section of the financial statements that I think are worth are, worth highlighting. Are they still alive? <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> they still alive. Uh, we have a pulse. <laughs> and I've got a little bonus uh, a little bonus one right at the end that you – know, just a couple of numbers that you got, you got to try and guess if the story is true or not, Ooh, if it's a I real like company it. or not. I like Ooh. it. I've I got, got a fun little little quiz question as well that sort of popped up, so we'll keep them rolling. Oh, beautiful, boys. Right. Just to uh, keep Twitter happy, we'll start with the uranium story, eh? Fuck it, mate. You lead out with the uranium story, doubles the views. Yeah, yesterday's episode's flying, the Kazadam Prom one. <laughs> oh, cheers to all me mates out there. Right. Fission and Paladin. Now, for those who don't know, that haven't tuned in. So Paladin and Fission Uranium Corp are in the process of trying to lock in a all script merger. So plenty of commentary around the, you'd say, the lack of geographical synergies. They do have uranium as a synergy, so that that and does help. Yeah, yeah. And people. Um, and so Paladin, Paladin have got the Langer Heinrich mine, which is now, you know, processing the old stockpiles in Namibia, restart job due to start mining in the coming years again. And they've also got the advanced exploration projects in WA and Queensland, which have pretty much been on ice due to, you know, uranium prices and government. They've also got the Michelin deposit all the way over in the east of Canada in Labrador. And then Fission has the Patterson Lake South project, which is also called PLS in the Atabasca Basin right next door to Next Gen's Arrow. It's like not high grade like Next Gen, but a lot shallower. So there's a lot of PLSs in our our world. There's there's that's the PLS project. There's PLS, which is the ticket Pil- for Pilbara. And then sometimes when you're talking about ISR companies, there's pregnant leech solution PLS. Oh, there you go. So anyway, oh, int- maybe P- Pilbara Minerals <laughs> might get into uranium. There's a synergy. <laughs> Never say never. Oh, say, say, bloody tuned. Right. So the date. What's happened today? The date of the Paladin Fission scheme vote. So the, I think the date of the vote, the meeting itself, has been extended to September 9th. They're trying to encourage pro- proxy votes have to be in before the 5th of September. Uh, I think the meeting was previously 26th of August. So why would you extend a meeting? I think we can infer, infer they are struggling to get a sufficient amount of yes votes mm-hmm. casted. Yeah. Percentage of yes votes. Their proxies would have come in already for the, for the meeting that was scheduled for yesterday or whatever. And they're, they're like, well, we, we're, we're trying to buy a bit of time. To we, try. Haven't, we haven't got enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and so, I, even I had it wrong in my head this morning. Anyway, bloody, we had a bit of finance education from the powers that be here. So they need, they need two thirds of votes cast in favour. And that's inclusive of options that vote as well. It's like two separate parts of it. I'll bring up the explanation here. So that's not 66 and two thirds percent of 
total shares. It's 66 and two thirds of who votes. Of the shares that vote. So some people can not vote and abstain their vote effectively. And you also need, same same as in Oz, you need a simple majority of persons present, i.e. 50% of the security holders present by number. Whereas Australia for schemes are usually 75% instead of 66 and two thirds. So Bit easier to get done here than Australia. Australia is still Maddie, the fifty by number. Do you need a minimum number of shares to vote as well? I don't know. Do you? I I tried to find out. I did a pretty no, brief they're, search. They're, I don't they're, think they're, you do. they're the only conditions of a scheme. Yeah, I did. Just those two. I, I yeah. thought so. I just wanted to double check. Yeah. So yeah, and interesting. The, and the way. Um, so the and. What they're, what they're saying in today's announcement is the majority of votes cast to date support the arrangement, which is still less than the 66 and two thirds required to approve the arrangement. So it's saying that the percent yes votes that have been cast so far must lie in between 50% and 66 and two thirds. Very interesting. Which it needs to be. So it's like, even though majority of vote in favour, that's good for fuck all if you ain't got the 66.6%. So basically unless unless they get a giant influx of people who'd previously, you know, hadn't even bothered to vote yet, cu- just come in the door over the next like, week mm. um, and vote yes, then it, it looks pretty unlikely to just simply pass that through. As long as more than two-thirds of them that come in the door vote yes, the it will might get up to two-thirds. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right. So What's we'll go. The, you, you did a bit of history oh, here, well, mate. I, so I, I Delved into the history and it might or might not be pertinent, but we'll get to the punchline at the end. So one of those two. This is why oh, fuck how good's Canada. Canada is West Perth and Cottesloe on steroids. It is bloody spin out central. Love the joint. It's bloody plenty happening. So fission uranium history. So look, because the current CEO of Fission Uranium Corp is Ross McElroy, but the big dog who started all this is this uh, Dev Rendawa. So he founded Strathmore Minerals back in 1996 and then in 2007, Dev spun Fission Energy Corp, not Fission Uranium, Fission Energy Corp out of Strathmore to focus on uranium exploration in Saskatchewan. So, And then Dev uh, went to run Fission Energy and then current Fission Uranium CEO, uh, Ross McElroy, he joined Fission Energy in 2007. I think he was with like Kamiko and that before that. He was part of the MacArthur River discovery, I think. So they've obviously had a lot of uranium tenure. And so he come on as like the head of the technical team, the, the COO, Chief GO, and that led to the d- discovery of the Waterbury Lake uh, project. And then they also discovered the PLS deposit, which is Fission Uranium's uh, – flagship thing they've got today, discovered that in 2012. Now, Fission Energy Corp then sold its this Waterbury Lake discovery and a larger selection of bloody other assets to Denison Mines in 2013. That was an all-script deal. And part of that deal was to spin out Fission Uranium Corp, which is the vehicle that held 50% of the PLS deposit. Other 50% was held by this Alpha Minerals. And then Dev ran uh, Fission Uranium Corp uh, and Ross McElroy was again the head of the technical team. And then you also had this F3 Uranium incorporated in 2013. as a That was a wholly owned subsidiary of Fission Uranium. And that ho- held all the other exploration assets other than the PLS project. And you would, you'd see F3 Uranium floating around today. Let me guess, did listed. that get spun out? Oh, so <laughs> it was it was like a, it's like a spin-out after this spin-out. So, so then in November 2013... Fission Uranium did this all script deal to acquire Alpha Minerals to get 100% ownership of PLS. And then from that, Fission 3.0 was spun out and F3 Uranium was no longer a sus- subsidiary of Fission. And that held like, I'll bring up the map, that holds the like the Patterson Lake North project. So tenure around uh, PLS and Next Gen's Arrow and everything. So that Fission 3.0 was renamed to F3 Uranium last year. So it's just like, mate, it's just shit. It's just like pick a bloody, pick a number out of the jar. It's so good. So, uh, and then since its inception, F3 Uranium has been run by 
Devrandawa. He's been the CEO. CEO. So he just always runs the spin out. Off yeah, the spin out, runs off the spin out. And he runs. So he was running F3 and he was also running Fission Uranium as well. And then it was only in 2020 then that Ross McElroy was Jeez. became CEO of Fission Uranium and Dev stepped down. But interestingly, in 2015, Denison, who did the deal back in 2012, which what Fission Uranium got spun out to, Denison and Fission Uranium were actually going to merge. Uh, but the retail punters blocked the deal. Exact same wording was used in that deal failure as it was today for Fission and Paladin. Majority of Fission shares oh. were voted in favour of the merger, but the total fell short of the required two-thirds needed to close the deal. Wow. So I wow. found that very do, interesting. Do, do you know any – do you have any information about the – like who, who the blocking shareholders were? They said – the article I read, it said it was retail. retail. Mostly, mostly retail that blocked the deal. Interesting. And often the – there's a retail contingent that's kind of, you know, friends of management or friends of the founders yeah. and stuff like that that maybe the, the founder has influence Mate, could, over. Could have been the rise of tw- – could have been the Twitter force back in 2015. Was Twitter big in 2015? I don't think so. Oh, could, have could have been. What was that? What were those um, – no, nah, that well, – I'm thinking of um, GameStop. What was the big chat? The, that was, was a Reddit, Reddit thread, yeah. wasn't it? But maybe, I think – Maybe there was a bloody – Wall Street fi- Bets. Canada would have been CEO. Yeah, Wall CEO Street Bets, well. that's it. <laughs> Yeah, so that yeah. um uh anyway, so as I said, 2020, that's when Ross took over CEO role at Fission Uranium. And then obviously Dev still held the CEO role at F3 Uranium, which he uh still does now. So And they had a they had a bumper run, I think late 22, early 23. They jumped over 5x in a pretty short period of time. And I remember um a couple fundies mentioned them when we, you know, early days on the podcast, mid-23. So yeah. they've fallen back a little bit, but yeah, they had a hell so of a they did run have a half decent, some half decent hits and discoveries there, but it sort of just hasn't really taken off. I remember, yeah, I remember one of the funds saying that that was the one they were looking at, but it just hasn't really uh, come to fruition yet. Even talk about another spin out. This one's unrelated before I get to the punchline. Mate, F3's uh, spinning out 17 expiration assets into oh, no. F4. Oh, no. And it was, uh, it was approved, the court approved it, a week and a bit ago. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> How good is Canada? Get me over there. So we've got F4 now coming. That'll be trading soon by the sounds. Oh, geez. Now, let's look at the top shareholders of Fission. Now, it's – I think I got this off. Is it tip pranks or something? But I, So I'm not sure how accurate this is. I think it's pretty hard to get full um, disclosure on top shareholders for TSX companies. But CGN, the Chinese uh, nuclear company, they own – 11.26%. I think they were about – they originally came in at like 20%, but they're, they, they're obviously a big shareholder. So um, you would assume they just want the fucking uranium. So you would assume they would vote in favour? Don't know. Don't mm-hmm. know. Yep. Uh, Sprott, 8%. I'm doing some bloody – Johnny, give me a call, mate, if you're listening. Uh He's, I don't know what, what, where Sprott sits with this, but the interesting bit, and you're talking about influence, Trav, mm. old Dev, he looks to still hold about 0.61 and a bit percent of Fission. That's the shares though, but he'd, he'd probably own a bunch of the options if he was a – Yeah, he, I'm not, he, not sure I reckon sure he would have s- just laced yeah. his pockets. With yeah, him. so I don't know if he's still got – Options. I'm not sure. I probably got fucking yeah. have to go into Cedar. And God he, help me. And he'd probably uh, he'd probably control a large block of whoever has the options just yeah. by influence and yeah. and, yeah. and also the shares too. Yeah. So yeah. that and as we said, options are part of this sixty six yeah. and two thirds. So and word on the decline. I am pretty sure he opposes the deal. Gotcha. I've been told. Very so good. Dev opposes the fission. Paladin deal. So the fact that he's on the register, not sure if he has options or not, but obviously being around the traps uh, and the, I guess the OG of these companies, going to be interesting to see if he is what's going on there and if that's part of why they're not able to get the votes yet or not. So there's, there's a few things that could happen here, Maddie. Like, and if Canada is anything like Australia, which probably is, there'd be. Um, 
proxy, like, you know, pro- pro- proxy solicitation firms um, engaged and they'd be calling up the shareholders, being like, oh, have you voted? You sure you haven't voted? Do you need assistance? Like all this sort of stuff. There'd be a lot of campaigning to, to encourage it. Um, so That's a great point, Trevor. What, what do you think they would advise? Because they'd be advising, obviously, and that, you know, the flow on is the ETFs, the uranium ones, the, you know, the, the Sprott Junior ETF and those ones. I'm sure, like I haven't looked, but that they would hold – a, a decent position as well. I mean, yeah. we tend to see these guys vote in line with board if, you know, everything's sort of kosher. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what, what votes have been received versus haven't. I would have thought the, the ETFs would have to vote via the, you know, via the, the, the proxy due date. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think um, Sprott would. I'm not sure. Cause it'd, it'd be part of the... Yeah. yeah. I th- oh, no, because that's I think that Sprott there, that would... Be the Sprott ETF, yeah, probably. I assume. Yeah, probably. Because Global X is. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. In, in in general, it's it's pretty damn tricky for the ETFs not to vote in favour of a board yeah. recommended deal. Yeah. Um, the but, and then you've like it's kind of open game for it for an interloper if they wanted to pop up here with a better offer. Um, you know, is it is it is it too late for a recut of the deal as well? Sometimes well, they might already hold out because they want. They want you know a bit more of the pie, and, mm. and that can sometimes swing swing these voters who've been <coughs> opposing it. Because I saw the bit of analyst commentary today on what it's valued at today compared to when it uh, the deal was done. They said at the time of the announcement, the transaction implied a dollar thirty per share valuation for Fission, uh, 0.64 times consensus nav. Because Paladin's share price has obviously dropped as well, along but I think uh, along with um, Fission as well, but. The share prices today imply a valuation of a dollar seven per fission share, and the offer now equates to 0.5 at three times fission's consensus nav. So, whether and you you look at it, the old Twitter sphere, a lot of chat about whether people are holding out, hoping for either a deal re- recut or or an interloper or something. It's like it lo- looks like there a lot of them are sitting back, not voting, mm. um, to see what happens. So they obviously didn't get. One, the percentage through the door and obviously enough – not that enough votes count, but they need a lot more, Blade. They know still a lot are still on the sideline and they need them to tick bloody yes. So it's uh, very, very interesting. I can see the um, the Sprott Uranium Miners Trust holds 43 million shares. So that oh, – going roughly off an 830 million market cap and a, a share price just under a buck is a bit over 5%. Yeah, maybe there's. Yeah, so well. less, I don't know if they hold any separate to the ETFs or not, because that one says sixty nine million. But as I said, they're not. Can't say that is one hundred percent accurate. So there could be sprout wealth management. These these sorts of things too. I'm not sure if they're clumped in together or not. Yeah, so there's a bit of bit of action here. Oh, buddy, uh, be very interesting. Big, very big, interesting. What do you think? It's fascinating. I I think it is super interesting when a when a deal melts up in um yeah you you kind of. Yeah, you 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 hope you, sh- you hope share like generally shareholders kind of vote vote in line with deals. It's kind of un- unusual that you have enough of a contingent kind of holding out for for a deal not to get over the line via a you know a scheme, a scheme vote, especially mm-hmm. with only a sixty six percent kind of threshold in Canada. But um, yeah, tough. Yeah. You wouldn't get it through in Australia if they can't get it through sixty six two thirds in Canada. Yeah, so it, it, it'd be interesting to see if it's uh, based on what uranium's doing at the moment because it's uh, been bloody hammered down everything's gone down a lot since this has happened if that's just changed the sentiment a bit uh, and they're going to hold out yeah it, it volatility is just bad for deals in general mm. like you need kind of stability to get a deal over the line otherwise you know one party's winning more than the other and people get unhappy and blah 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 yeah yeah so anyway we can we can chuck up a video that we've shown before of the pls project have a look at it here bloody money miners i'm saying to mine i'm seeing water you know what else i'm saying Greenland's equipment. Oh, every time I see water now, I just think freaking Greenland's. You think mining, you think water, you think Greenland's. Mate, right, get get Greenland's over the Athabasca Basin to analyse that water. They analyse water. Before what, before they do anything, water analysis experts. What? How do they analyse water? Oh, if I knew, there wouldn't be a need for Greenland's. Mm. No one knows. <laughs> this is proprietary. How they do it. Mate, they That's even, the IP. They even analyse water that you don't have. And then bloody, they'll just smash the ball fields in to get that water for you, mate. Turnkey mine water management, bloody, mate. They're not scared of the Athabasca Basin nah. at all. They'll get a deal over the line for you, bloody. Get them over there. They're probably going to set up an office over there, bloody. Expand from Perth and Leonora. 
So get in quick before they get huge. Go uh, Greenlands. Recommendation. <laughs> Beauty. Right, let's get into the financial stuff. I'm seeing dollar signs. Big dollar signs, mate. We're going to talk about BHB now. So obviously the annual results came out, as we said before, and I, I can't quite believe, you know, what annual reporting has kind of come to. There was seven announcements and 466 pages today. So there's a fair bit of sifting to try and uh, find what's actually worth reading. Jeez, you're the right man for that job, JD. <laughs> it just about defeated me. I'm not sure about that, mate. But um, I, I thought it'd be interesting to try and pull out three details that are interesting and just have a bit of a chat about them. I'm keen to hear what you guys think too. So the first one, something I kind of dug for, is pretty keen to hear their commentary. They do this sort of, you know, uh, global economics and commodity commentary, talking about all the uh, the metals and um, industries in which they're in, as well as, you know, inflation and these sorts of things around the world, in particular in the countries in which they're operating. So iron ore, obviously it's been a a huge deal. We've been seeing newspaper headlines every other day about what it could kind of means for Australia, what it means for our budget, what it means for all the miners out there. You can just look at the uh, the year to date performance of Fortescue, all the majors, Minres, Champion Iron, Terra, all of them are down quite substantially year to date. So I thought it'd be good to get a feel for it. So up four the first bucks point, last night, JD. She had a bit. I think it's back above hundred now. Eh? Yeah, yeah. I saw a one one hundred one bucks. I think it hit ninety two or something a couple of weeks ago. So yeah. the uh, the longer term trend or the the medium term trend, I guess, hasn't been quite as friendly. And what what I get to at the end of this really speaks to that, and it's really interesting. So, firstly, on the Chinese property market, because that's what everyone sort of points to straight away. So they expect that the Chinese property market will bottom next calendar year. And they, they say what to look out for is first a, uh, a slowdown in housing sales and then construction activity naturally will roll off after that. Is that is that consistent and, with what they've been predicting so far, JD, or has it been changing? I mean, it, it always kind of chops and changes. I mean, I think they've got a lot more clarity on it now. I, I haven't actually honed in too much on what BHB have said on this in, in the previous annual results, but I I think this has come into a lot more of focus, you know, next year's relatively short. We're already here in August. I anticipate something's going to stop kind of mid next year in, in these kind of markets that's happening pretty quickly. And I mean, a lot of it has come back on the, um, the commentary that the Chinese, uh, you know, communist party has come out with that. They're going to boost it. They're going to try and destock the the vacant housing and all these sorts of things. But it was interesting to, to put that into context because we always think of the Chinese property market being the, the sort of sink for all this demand, but, they said that the uh, machinery and equipment sector is now going to overtake the construction sector as the largest share of steel demand. And we'd kind of spoken about this the, the past couple of weeks, but I thought that was pretty interesting to, to have it actually quantified and confirmed. Mm. What about another one? What about old yeah. India? The rise of yeah, India, India, JD. India is super interesting because we'd spoken about it a lot in the context of Met Coal last week. And that, you know, tied in very well with what they said. It's, you know, a. Uh, a benefit on two fronts for BHB. You got your iron ore and your met coal. They already sell over forty percent of their met coal to India, and they're super bullish. India. They're talking about a four x in the demand over the next couple of decades in stainless steel demand out of India, which is which is super interesting to see. It's been confirmed by every other miner out there. Now, the last point that I found really interesting, guys, is on the the iron ore cost curve because I think you see you see probably too much fear mongering out there that there's going to be a massive crash in the iron ore price. Australia's budget's going to be cooked and people just kind of run with it. So it's it's really interesting to hear that kind of quantified, not just the sort of why, but the um the what. So they're talking about a cost support level between 80 and 100 bucks. Obviously we're always talking in 62% equivalent here. And they talk about heaps of support coming from three different players. You got your your juniors in Australia and Brazil, you've got the higher, um, the high cost, lower grade Indian exports, and then you've got the shoulder of the Chinese domestic cost curve. Now that kind of equates for 170 million tons out there that comes in over 80 bucks a ton. Yeah. Now for context, that is on a 1.6 billion ton seaborne market or a 2.5 billion ton annual consumption in uh, in iron ore. So pretty 
pretty not oh what about 10 percent yeah yeah 10 percent so yeah so okay so if, if iron ore dig below go below 80 bucks a ton is it like those ones potentially start curtailing what's probably going to happen yeah you need to see one or a combination of two things obviously it's always demand and supply so on the demand front this is why everyone's honed in on china you'd need demand to roll off quite seriously and for that to happen in one country alone would be massive i don't think it's feasible you'd need a, a roll off in demand across the world but on the supply side i found it even more interesting you'd essentially need that 170 million tons to be replaced by lower cost operations and i think over time there's actually a real cost that the, uh, a real chance that this happens because you've got samandu coming online that's 100 to 120 million tons then you've got BHB, FMG and Rio all wanting to ramp up, you know, 10, 20 million tonnes per annum production. You've also got MinRes trying to bring Onzo online. They're talking about 35 million tonnes of a, a lower grade sort of product. And, you know, I've seen some analysts out there thinking a way bigger number than that. Again, this this will take time, but it's it's interesting to have this sort of quantified and see that support level around 90 bucks actually hold up pretty strongly over the past half year. Yeah, because what... How, what what is mint? What do you know? What the Onslow cost is, or it's a hard one to figure out because of the whole haul road jobby. Do you want the cost that they tell you it's going to be, or do you want the real yeah? Well, cost what are they? What do they tell us at the moment? There's a bit, there's a bit of a, a changing of hands with the, uh, you know, C, CSI and all these sorts of things. Yeah, so yeah. I, quote, I, I haven't mid, had a close. I think look they quote lately. a mid sixties, you know, fully loaded cost, but. Uh, yeah, and keep, that's keep like in mind they technically don't, the whole road, but then that bit they're not come, producing a sixty-two percent. Like yeah, it, either it's a, it's you know there's a deduction for Paid, yeah 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 so, yeah. so they're going to get a discount to that that price we're talking about there. Yeah, right. Okay, so what's what's the next thing you got going on? Big All right, Jay, the next eh? one's way more. The next one is way more vanilla. It's just the dividend, and it's the fact that they've cut it. This was the headline story on you know the AFR and everywhere oh, else that was one. reporting about it. Yeah, so um, it's it's pretty interesting to look about it, look at it in detail because the underlying earnings of the company were up. You know, EBITDA profit. It was a strong year. Commodity prices were decent all round. As a reminder, BHB pays out a minimum of fifty percent of their underlying profit. Now, I straight away thought about Yanco. A lot of their shareholders would have loved to have a, a policy like that in place. Mate, they had it. They just chose not to do it. They treated it like a special dividend. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Well. <laughs> yeah, you need you need with in BHB's case as well the you know the the three caveats that they kind of put in place. But geez, can you imagine if a BHB just ignored those? I think there'd be a <laughs> yeah almost riots on the street with all the retirees out there. Oh mate, so, I'll tell you, you know the big the biggest impact of all these dividends getting cut is like think of your lo- your local RSLs for the roast pork special on a Wednesday night. Like <laughs> the seventy year olds aren't going down there and they're not slapping tenor in the pokies because they're not getting their dividends. This is spreading far and wide. The effect of these dividends, it's a, it's the economy's going no good, crash. mate. No good. Far what, what out. Was, what was the uh, the percentage payout that Yanko have? I like think 50? it was it was some like they could choose between uh, a lower range, a, a lower and yeah. an upper bound um, of, of yeah. the the greater or lesser of end patent free cash flow. I can't remember the exact numbers, but yeah, they do have yeah, they yeah. do have a, a dividend policy. Yeah, interesting. So um, <laughs> they paid fifty four percent here, and that's the the lowest it's been since twenty seventeen. Now the why behind it is is way more interesting. Essentially, it's the focus on growth i.e. capex. So it really kind of hits home how capital intensive mining is. And, you know, the the flow on effect of or the flow on kind of thought of that is that you, it's explained why BHB loves these long life, low cost assets. So you see pretty close to the front, these margins, a 68% EBITDA margin on the iron ore business, which is phenomenal by any account, but that only comes after the billions and billions have been sunk over time in in capex and it's a another reason why you shouldn't just look at the multiples of these mining companies you should you know look at nav and do various forms of analysis and bhb love to show this off by talking about the uh the three-year average royce and that is essentially just showing the um the higher returns on the cap on capital employed that bhp have 
versus Glencore, Rio Tinto and all these other Is that return companies. on invested capital? Is that that one, Rowick uh, or whatever? Return on capital employed is, is the metric. Yeah. They, oh, that's they, another one. They return, run, oh, run Rose. Rose. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not Rowick, Rose. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Sli- slightly different, equally confusing. Yeah. So to, to put it in a couple numbers, they did US $9.3 billion in CapEx this year, CapEx and exploration. Ooh. They're guiding to a medium term of US eleven billion per annum in capex. Now that's a that's a real step up from the seven and a half billion sort of level that we saw for quite a few years. So you can see as they look to get all these copper assets and all these sort of future facing commodities as they put it online, there is a huge tick up in the capex that needs to be spent to uh, to see the the returns that justify it. Yeah, and when you think of like the like pretty hefty return on capital employed numbers, it's just because you got all this sunk infrastructure in the Pilbara. And so you can spend some marginally small amount of capital in the Pilbara to just expand iron ore a little bit. And like the IRR on that is like fucking in the triple digits. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the uh, the last thing that stood out was their commentary on a whole bunch of different things. I'm just going to kind of clump together green transition, future facing commodities, inflation, and I'll rattle off a few different parts. You guys can jump in if anything sort of piques your interest. The first one was on copper. They're talking about calendar year 24 and 25, Chinese copper demand expectations being downgraded. So that saw 6% growth over the last year, but they're anticipating only 1% or 2% growth in the coming year. Now, to add to that on the on the copper market, they're seeing a surplus over this year and next year as well. The next point that stood out was on blast furnaces. So this is what you need coking coal for in the, the steelmaking process. And they said it is unlikely to be, or blast furnaces are unlikely to be displaced at scale by any new tech for decades. Now, that's not surprising. We spoke with Matt Water and we've spoken with other people about that but it's not something you generally see BHB talk too loudly about. So it's interesting to see them actually put it into words in um, in their presentations. The next thing that uh, really stood out is on the back of, again, the cold chats that we had last week, they are talking about a durable premium for the higher grade met coals out there. And this is directly a result of regulation, specifically in Queensland, as well as supply issues. So they're seeing a whole bunch of historically good assets move up on the cost curve as they just become more challenging. Yeah, Drew, Next point. when are we saying these premiums? The, the, is there a premium you, anywhere you, the, at the, the moment? The, I mean, coal prices you absolutely are so, see them. Coal prices so are. elevated. Yeah, that's what that's what they're talking about. I mean, you, there are all of these like um, – it's not just like you have one co- coking coal price and one yeah. thermal coal price. There's there's all of these like, you know – The high vol, mid vol. Exactly. Yeah. Everything's bespoke. And so it comes into these kind of deductions from the index depending on what – spec of product you provide from which location so coal coal's probably the best example where we're seeing premiums at i the think moment. they exist every everywhere it's just like and it's it, but it's not it's not it doesn't reflect in the lme price it's just a, a deduction or, or or an addition uh, to yeah. to your index yeah. based on the spec of the product you provide in in, in any market yeah. yeah yeah she's a handshake deal yeah, 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 like you know, the, the copper traders will like you know there'll be all these deductions based on the, the smelting kind of quality and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. The, the arsenic content, all of, that's in my mind like the effect of premiums and stuff flowing through for better better quality. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You see it in in payabilities they talk about in in nickel, in copper, how the the TCRCs are reflected, and in coal you're talking about relativity, like we spoke about Whitehaven, and that is why BHB have sort of fine tuned their portfolio and sold. White, well, one of the reasons, sold Whitehaven and, and Dornia, and now they talk about a greater portion of the portfolio receiving, you know, or being indexed to the, the PLV FOB index, which is the, you know, the kind of call it premium uh, Metcol index out there. Mm, so there's just no premiums based on where it comes from yet. No. Oh, no. No, I mean, they, they do speak about that though and they they – highlight, I mean, it's not it's not evident yet, but they highlight that their portfolio of coke and coal assets sets them up well for a future where the carbon intensity of the product is taken into account or if mm. there is a, a carbon tax or anything like this, they are well positioned for that, but it's not something we're seeing just yet. Did well find in that in 600 odd pages, JD. Well done, mate. <laughs> Thanks, uh, mate. What so, do you got next? So the next few points that really mm. stood out are Inflation in, again, in, in copper, but this time in regards to CapEx. So they're talking about copper CapEx remaining, you know, stubbornly persistent and 
straight away I'm thinking about the the ramifications of that. Is it to sort of bet on producers out there because it's harder to get you know new production online? Is it a heightened risk for single asset developers out there? Maybe they're going to experience capex blowouts. They're just a couple of ideas that kind of come to mind on that front. The next couple of points really hone in on EV. So they're talking about a real slowdown in EV sales across the developed world. Specific to the US, they're talking about the emission standards across fleets being watered down. This means from the, I think the second biggest car buyer in the world, a real slowdown in EV uptake, which was sort of interesting to um to put in perspective. And then the last couple of points are on inflation. So <clears throat> this will be a welcome news, and I'm sure a lot of the companies out there are experiencing it already, but inflation in Australia, in particular in wages, they've seen start to pull back. Now, they've had productivity work against this a bit, but it is still a good sign for a lot of the miners out there in Australia. Unfortunately, in Chile, though, where they've got a fair few operations, they've um, seen inflation pick back up over the past couple of months. And a detail that I had no idea about, the uh, Chilean Central Bank has already cut interest rates by 5.5%. So they had them over 11%. They've pulled them all the way back to 5.75% in in recent months to try and stimulate the economy. And then they've seen inflation kick up again. So it's a a real balancing act. And, you know, obviously not exactly like Australia, but there are similarities between the the Chilean economy and the Australian economy. So maybe one for the the central bankers to to kind of look at there. Bloody beautiful, And that is me. Oh, mate. One quick... One quick quiz question, fellas. Oh. What do you reckon in terms of millions of US dollars a $1 change in the iron ore price does to the underlying EBITDA of BHB? What was their EBITDA this year? $29 billion. What, how many How many millions of tonnes of, of iron ore do they produce? Uh, $270. i am going to go... What did you say? Twenty nine billion was there a bit da? Twenty nine billion and geez, off the top of my head, two two thirds of the income I'm gonna, comes from. I'm going to say maybe even more. Between one and three billion. A one dollar change. Yeah. It's a bit. It's a bit lower than that. Ah, it was a guess. <laughs> what, what did you guess? <laughs> one billion. Oh, one one billion, and it's lower than one billion. This is just a one dollar change in the iron ore price. Does to the EBITDA? Yeah. Oh. I don't know. What's the answer? Two hundred thirty-three million. Oh. Yeah, my, my calculation was one hundred eighty-nine that I did in my, my math. <laughs> I'll say I'll say at one dollar because they produce it what bloody twenty bucks a ton. So I'm like, it should be five yeah. percent of the EBITDA. So that's that's uh, what's that? Whatever that is, one hundred fifty million. So a bit above that. Two hundred eighty-nine. There you go. The logic isn't not, bad. Not a billion. Yeah, pretty- <laughs> <laughs> One to three. <laughs> That's it. All right. Let's talk about a bit of lithium again, hey? Go on. Yeah, mate. Thanks for making um, BHP interesting for once. <laughs> <laughs> this was I tried. <laughs> oh, oh, you're going to say that, but I'm going to say what you were going to say. I'll let you say it. <laughs> Galan, uh, the, the Argentinian lithium, lithium brine developer, that, they've had a whirlwind um, of a time lately with a strange unsolicited takeover bid from Energy X that leaked street talk over the diggers week that um, was whatsapp was flying at diggers everyone's like is there any news on the galan deal i'm like sorry i'm at the palace <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh well today they've they've come out with um this offtake prepayment mou and uh, with this is a mouthful uh chengdu uh, chem fizz chemical industry company limited the key parts of this mou to to keep in mind is that chem is going to provide galan with a us 40 million dollar facility that they can use to continue project development. Galan is committed to supplying a minimum of, of 23,000 tonnes um, LCE to, to Chemphys and kind of none of the, you know, the, 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 the dirty terms are in the, in the announcement, but but Chemphys would get first ranking security over the, the HMW project of, of Galan's as well. Chen, do, is that China? Yes. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> and those that have been following Galan, they might be a bit confused because this non-binding offtake MOU comes after a binding offtake agreement was announced with Glencore back in November last year. And at the time that was announced, it was stated to be subject to due diligence. We, we know that Glencore 
completed a site visit in January this year, according to Galan's March quarterly report, but then kind of things went a bit quiet on the Glencore front. Um, and in today's announcement, there's this paragraph, which doesn't name Glencore, but clearly it's about Glencore. It says, in relation to the offtake and financing prepayment facility now 16th of November, 2023, the company notes that it has not received both an offtake and financing proposal from the counterparty. And accordingly, the company could no longer proceed with that option. Now, when I read that statement, I assume Glencore walked away from the deal while in the due diligence phase. That's my assumption. Um, mm-hmm. And I think there's a few things worth mentioning with Galan that might not be immediately apparent too. Galan's arrangement with, with Glencore would have seen them selling their lithium chloride concentrate product to Glencore, who would have toll treated it to carbonate in Argentina. The lithium chloride concentrate is it, you know, it's a brine concentrate. It, it's in solution. Um, is that what comes out? Like just, is that what comes out of the ground? Oh, it's, it's an, it's an, yeah, it's an early step in the, in the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, so logistics are a bit, a bit challenging to work with, with that early stage product, right? Unless Galan comes up with the capital required to create like even an intermediate product. Um, yeah. They might be able to, you know, convert it into an uh, anhydrous product. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if some of this, um, you know, US $40 million dollar, uh, facility is, 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 is penned for, for that kind of work. But at the moment, like Galan's just in a very precarious financing situation. Take a look at the Spark chart. They top ticked around $2.35 in, in, in early 2022. They've fallen 95% uh, since Ooh. then, which is pretty ugly. Lithium price is obviously in the dunny. And it, you know, they're drawing on this at the market facility, which nukes their share price even further. And and there's there's clearly still you know a funding gap um, to get through to production when they expect that next year and, and now we've got an announcement of an MOU now MOUs of course are, are flimsy to start with but you know this one's kind of heavily conditional as well yeah oh, before you finish the that at the market facility yep is that like let me know if this metaphor is correct like the money is the keg of beer and the tap is the at the market facility and you just go pour it whenever you want it's kind of like that except that. you get punched in the face every time you yeah, and you, you so, got to, and you got to pour yourself a beer. It's like boom, boom, boom. Yeah, right. Yeah. So and that, the, that's a metaphor. Kind of like the, the level of the ke- the level of the keg is the share price. Uh, well, or, it's it's a bit worse. Should, the, should. the keg falls even faster. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <Bloody>. All good. <laughs> <sighs> well, I'll wrap it up with this remark. Glencore, they they don't just walk away from a good deal. Yeah, it'd be like walking away from a pint with Druba. <laughs> it's like. Why would you do it? Truba from K Drill. Truba from K Drill. <laughs> Mate, that's a that's a good deal that I don't think anyone else anyone's walked away from in history. Nah. You Dr- wouldn't, JD. You know, you wouldn't walk away from a pint with Druba, would you? It'd be rude to say no, oh, mate. Oh, mate. I'm, look, I'm putting it out there to the bloody crew and the team and the listeners. I just don't think there's any other WA exploration drilling company that offers such a bloody good turnkey solution for drilling. Yeah. I'll, I'll map it out for you. Well, you, he hasn't been given much love recently, but you got the best in the game, Ryan O'Sullivan. Yes. Managing the drilling contract. Elite. You've got the best drillers in the game drilling the RC in Diamond Holes. They do. And you get to have a point with Druba. Mate, you couldn't want – that the is – The best BD team. Mate, they, they, they are literally – now, this is fact. They are the only drilling company in history to have both Drew Harvey and Ryan O'Sullivan working for them in the same, at the same time. Dream. In the history of drilling. Dream team. So heart and soul to Goldfields Explorational Drill and Drew, his emails in the show notes. Hit him up for a pint and he'll, uh, he'll have you bloody, he'll have K-Drill drilling holes for you the quicker than you can say how good's Druba. Very true, Matty. Yes. Now to could, pivot anyway. to a company who um who did an offtake deal with Glencore that, that you know, uh, Glencore didn't walk away from. Ooh. 29 Metals. Uh, so they, they're they also in a, in a financing predicament of their own, though. 29 Metals, they, they reported their half-year results this morning. And rather than dwell on all of the details, I just wanted to highlight a couple of in-the-weeds elements from the, the reporting. First one, how's this sentence on the uh, front page of today's announcement? It's the seventh dot point from the top. It says, balance sheet strengthened during the six-month reporting period with a US $50 million offtake finance facility with Glencore finalised and an additional unallocated progress payment of $16 million received. Now, personally, I'm not sure it's fair to describe your balance sheet as, as strengthened when you became more levered. Net debt went from um, from $55 million to $132 million in the last six months. And if you just isolate the operating cash flow and the investing cash flow, 
um, from the last six months, we're looking at negative $50 million for the for the first half and despite sort of stellar copper prices in the period. So I think it's a bit of an, bit of an unfair characterization to describe the balance sheet as strengthened. So, what do you so reckon? Liqui- did liquidity increase but the net debt increased as well? Is that right? No, uh, li- li- liquidity, uh, I, I can't see the available funds, but I, you, uh, to me, balance sheet strength is determined with how resilient are you um, mm. looking forward and, and, you know, it's pretty they're pretty objectively less resilient <clears throat> as a result of having more drawn, more net debt in the in the capital structure, and yep. and and clearly less free cash flow generation potential to service that debt, as evidenced by the last six months of highly negative cash flow. Mm. There, was, there was a few head scratches, especially on that first page, but I'm I'm sure you'll get into it, so I won't step on your feet there. Yeah, um, but then then I went to the back, JD, because uh, I you know, just thought got to go to the back of the the financial statements, um, and some really interesting detail on Capricorn Copper. Basically, they, they impaired cap copper by a, a further thirty million dollars in this reporting period. Um, now, the net assets of the cap copper segment um, are one hundred and sixty-seven million in the financial statements, which is pretty damn similar to the one hundred and seventy-two million six months ago. So, you're probably wondering how can they impair thirty million but have a relatively similar carrying value still? Does that make sense? Well, they provide some good detail on the assumptions used uh, to calculate the carrying value of cap copper. Check them out here. So compared with a year ago, they're now calculating the carrying value using a long-term copper price nine hundred dollars higher. It's gone up from their assumed copper price has gone up from you know just above eight thousand to, to nearly nine thousand. Um, the assumed fair value of the copper resources not in the mine plan has has arbitrarily lifted from fifty million to eighty five million too, um, and they they attribute twenty six million dollars to Cap, copper, capex in the half, to chuck in some depreciation. They wrote down thirty million, plus another nine million right down for the ROM stockpiles, which you know apparently no longer valuable. And they've rejigged assumptions in the mine plan, so net assets look okay, righto? So, <laughs> so is the, the assumed fair value for the copper resource—that's a result of lifting that copper price. No, is it? that's, it that's not, in, not in the mine plan. So that's just basically you're doing an EV per ton oh, not calculation, the, and you, yeah. you're probably looking at market comparables and saying, well, copper equities who you know, aren't producing anything with their copper in the ground or went up. So therefore I can use a different rule of thumb metric on on my copper, copper tons that I'm never going to mine in my current mine plan. So you don't apply a commodity price to that to get that figure? No. Interesting. Yeah. No. You've got a mine plan on the stuff you're, you're going to mine and then and then that, you know, the, what, how they spell it out is, yeah, market comparables. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like the exploration upside in a broker report, you know. <laughs> uh, and um, okay, so then – then uh, if, if you're curious like me how sensitive Cap Copper's carrying value is to a change in some of the assumptions, thankfully we have been provided this neat sensitivity table. Um, look look here. So if, if, if long-term copper price was closer to $9,500 a tonne, which is still higher than, than they assumed a year ago, mind you, then that wipes off $80 million of value. Um, of the carrying value, and 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 if if operations restart twelve months later than their assumed uh, second half of of twenty twenty six, wipes off forty six million dollars of value. Yeah. So oh, yeah, good old Capricorn tweak the assumptions up. and make it all look okay. <laughs> yeah. So what's the summary of that? <laughs> uh, read read back to bit, front. Read back bit, to front. Looks a bit yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez, that I think blood, you can kind of bloody rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not good. You, you can see the the operations just aren't making any money and there's a big pile of debt, which is a, a bit of a sort of slow-burning tie bond. Is it, was there any commentary on Capricorn Copper around the operation, the water, the yeah. restart or yeah. like what is actually happening out there? Yeah, I, it, I, it's more of the same that we've been talking about for ages. You know, I just, yeah, just highlight a couple of, of interesting details. But one last one for you though, Maddie and JD. Uh, this is... Um, yeah, I just want you to tell me if you think this is real or not, right? Well, what do you guys think if I told you there was a mining company out there that reported full year results today? It did about $35 million NPAT in FY24. They're guiding about $55 million in, in EBITDA next year in FY25. It has no debt and an EV of $16 million. Would you believe me? <laughs> Must be the uh, way you've asked a question. I'm saying yes. Something on a very, very, very low multiple. What's on low multiples? Must be coal. It is a coal company. Oh. Uh, so the company is Bathurst Resources. They're producing just shy of two million tons of coal oh. as New Zealand's largest 
co-producer. As always, you know, there's some warts here. And to be completely fair, the consolidated cash balance actually fell in, in FY24 despite modest investment in their development project. So, you know, take the impact with a grain of salt. But, um, but you know, those numbers are what they report. So, there's yeah, it's pretty startling to kind of just read those numbers and think that's a, an actual company. Yeah, wow. Well, so two two million ton of coal a year and a sixteen mil EV. Yeah, um, it's like a hundred and thirty six million dollar market cap, but they've got a bunch of consolidated cash um, at various joint venture levels that kind of you know add up to a bit over a hundred. There you go, Bathurst. Wow. I would have always thought Bathurst Resources was in Bathurst. <laughs> in New South Wales, but it's not. And I think of when I, I heard it before, same, I assumed it was there, but it's obviously not. Mm. Oh, there you go. Very interesting. That is interesting. Shows but, you how much like NPAT can just be an accounting construct and you need to look at all the various kind of data points out there. What was bloody, uh, was it Buffett or Munger, your mates, JD, that said <laughs> you'd never apply EBITDA to anything that requires a lot of capital? Yeah, EBITDA is just bullshit earnings. CapEx is a real expense that people need to pay. I'm sure they'd love to not have to do these numbers like and just do quarterlies, but <laughs> must be required for some reason. Yeah, I think it's required with good reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff, boys. Good in the weeds. Axis Mining Technologies in the weeds for drill hole survey instrumentation. They go to the same detail you two went to just then to make sure shit is straight or tell you if it's not straight. Tell me who else gets in the weed, Matty. Oh, mate, MMS, they get in the weeds. They bloody dig up the weeds and fucking all the rocks below it and just move it everywhere. Bloody verify. You can fly over the weeds, bloody smack power and technology. You can electrocute the weeds. Bloody DSI underground, you can bloody dig a weed out with your friggin' bolts. Bloody Silverstone. Mate, mate, what the... You can drive over them, you can power them. They can can power the weeds. I was going to say they grow weeds, but (laughs) I'll delete that bit. (laughs) CRE insurance, mate, you want your weeds insured. Uh, CRE do weed insurance as well. I could not say that either. (laughs) The crop insurance. Crop crop, you want to insure your crops, bloody Greenland's equipment. You you want your weeds to get bigger, you can water them. Bloody uh, cane drill, they'll just send up. Bloody drill, bloody drill bit straight through all the weeds and find you some friggin' ore and spark charts. Probably got nothing to do with weeds at all. Some of the just, stock just graphs actually it. look like a weed. So, hooteroo, <laughs> money miners. Hooteroo. Hooteroo, lads. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.